Why is this tea shaped like a cigar? In this video, we're going to explain a new type of post-fermented tea that is hand-rolled into a very unique shape. We'll also compare it to the popular Japanese fermented tea called Natashiko Rose, a tea fermented using a similar process to the production of soy sauce, sake, and miso. Let's get started. So what we have here is what I'll call a tea cigar. This is a hand-packed post-fermented tea that's stored inside a bamboo sleeve. So this is how the, the tea came packaged. It was in, it was in here. And um, I just kind of you know, took this stopper off and, and pulled it out of the bamboo sleeve. And uh, now I'm gonna try to unwrap it. So the reason we're talking about fermented teas is because we recently launched a new type of Japanese fermented tea on the website. So for those of you who don't know, uh, post-fermented teas is one of the, the six main categories of teas. And the most common form of this is pu'er, so the, the category is often called pu'er, but this actually only refers to the teas produced in Yunnan. But there are other regions that produce post-fermented teas as well. Normally in Japan, you're going to find mostly Japanese green teas, but there are Japanese fermented teas as well, and they, those can be really good. So we just recently launched one called the Nadashiko Rose, it's also known as pink tea or the rosé of tea. It's a really beautiful fermented tea. So this began kind of my quest to um, understand more about the world of fermented teas, post-fermented teas. Um, the Natashiko, for example, is made by um, leaves that have been picked, rolled, steamed, dried, and then they're actually fermented with koji, which is the same microorganism used to produce Japanese classics like sake, miso, soy sauce. So it's a really cool kind of uh, treasure that we found in Japan that you're welcome to try if you want to visit our website uh, and pick some up. But let's begin our journey into the world of post-fermented teas, something that I'm not so experienced with. This one is from uh, Laos, and it's uh, hand-packaged in Fong Sali. And one of the things you'll notice, the most common way to, to present these packaged teas is in a cake. Uh, this is a little bit unique. It basically still is a cake. It's a similar concept, but it's just a much different shape. And so they might call this the cigar shape. So I went ahead and broke up the cake and stored it back in its bamboo sleeve here, as you can see. And uh, I'll be honest, it was pretty difficult to break this up. It was looser than maybe a typical pu'er cake, but there was still some difficulty getting out these larger leaves without getting too many of these leaf fragments here. So I did the best I could. I got about maybe about five grams, maybe a little bit less because I'm using a very small gaiwan here. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to preheat the teaware. So there's two things that this accomplishes. One, it kind of preheats everything so there's less heat loss just due to the porcelain. And the second is that it's a good way to uh, wake up the leaves. So using 95 degree water Celsius, 95 Celsius water for this experiment. So preheat guy one here. Go ahead and put these leaves in. You. Now, don't get any aroma on the dry leaves, but you just kind of wake them up. Mm. I'm getting this very wild flavor, like it's it's like wild flowers, very dry. The aroma is not the aroma is very subtle. I would say it's a little bit earthy. Maybe some tree bark in there. We'll see what we get in the taste. So I'm using a very high leaf to water ratio, but I'm using very short infusions. So this is more consistent with a Gong Fu style brew. So I'm gonna be using 10 seconds for the first brewing. And I like to describe this as a, a good way to get to know a tea because you're seeing it in a lot of different angles. You're seeing it, the first outer layer of it, which is mostly you know, the aromatics, Kind of this sort of flowery aroma heavy infusion and then you get more into the body of the tea later so as you can see there's slightly orangish yellow color 
maybe peach color, you could say. There's not a whole lot coming off of the tea yet. It's, uh, it's a little bit dry still. Starting to get just the first hints of this nutty flavor. A little bit of almonds, a little bit of peanuts. There is some sweetness, like a cooked sweetness to it. But I think we'll get to know more about this tea in the next infusion. So I'm going to add five seconds to the infusion each time. So this one's going to be 15 seconds. I usually go 10 seconds the first one, then 15, then 20. Color's more or less the same. It's kind of that yellowish orange, golden orange, peach color, however you want to call it. There is a little bit of this foam on the top. It's kind of interesting. If this were a Japanese tea, I would say it's the essential oil layer. I'm not exactly familiar with this particular tea, but it could be this, the same thing. Mm. Yeah, getting much more into the sweetness of the tea. I'm getting some kind of cooked fruits, the banana, like a tiny bit of peach. It is quite interesting that you get these fruity flavors from a post-fermented tea. So for example, the Natashiko Rose, there you get a, a very clear, in, in my opinion, strawberry from it. So the tea kind of has this almost like, you know, cinnamon, almost a little bit roasted flavor. And then there's also this kind of sweet strawberry flavor that comes along with the tea. So the Natashiko Rose is really nice for that reason. Compared to this one, this tea I would say is much drier compared to the Natashiko. Uh, that's not the entire category of pu'er. That's just this particular one. A lot of raw pu'er, which is what this one is, to me tastes a little bit dry. Uh, I get much more of the minerality to it. You know, you feel it kind of interacting with your palate more. There's more physicality. Uh, but I actually do find the mouthfeel to be a little bit thinner. So the Natashiko is actually, to me, is like a heavier tea. You, know, you, you have this cloudy pink, pinkish brown infusion, and it's, it's quite heavy. So there's a lot of differences and some similarities between these two teas. That's why I thought it would be interesting to dive into the tasting of this one. Um, but let's just go ahead and do two, or, two more brewings and see how this taste evolves. So the liqueur is still the same color, I would say. And you see there's a pretty big leaf in there. Um, it's not really that big of a problem. This tea continues to challenge me. Now it's evolving, but I'm not sure how to exactly describe the flavor. It is getting a little bit drier. It's getting, I don't want to say more tannic, but you can definitely feel the physicality of the tea more as it kind of tingles on your palate. Uh, I would say that's minerality, but it's not, it's not quite minerality. It's maybe more, almost like a sourness or like a saltiness. Yeah, definitely kind of, I don't want to say salty, but it, it kind of interacts with your palate the same way that salt might. You know, it kind of has this, a little bit of this, um, this puckering sensation. But as you know, like adding salt to food can also kind of clean, create like a cleaner finish. So it really kind of rounds out this tea, gives it structure, gives it character, which I like. Yeah, I'm actually getting a little bit, now I'm getting a little bit of this roasted flavor. It's not, I don't believe it. I mean, it is probably pan fire tea, but it's not roasted. So I'm not exactly sure where this roasted flavor is coming from, but sometimes it, you do get it with an unroasted tea. So this tea is very good. The tasting notes I'm having a little bit of a hard time with because I'm really just not used to the flavor. These raw pu'er teas kind of have their own unique flavor to them that it's very difficult to describe. So I understand that these tasting notes like, you know, cooked peanuts and cooked fruits maybe don't sound so appetizing. Um, but once you kind of understand the tea, you'll, you'll start to realize that it does have an enjoyable flavor to it, even though it's not something that you would normally experience in other types of foods or drinks. It is nice, and the body sensation is really good. It's, it's very energizing. Um, I 
it's very early in the morning right now and I'm feeling like I'm waking up. Yeah, this one I'm, I'm starting to get yeah, more, more of this earthiness, more of this kind of I've heard a tasting note that I recently that I like, and it's kind of this pine, this kind of pine note. It's like a very crisp, very wild um, tasting note that you would get from, you know, spending time in the woods or something. It's like a very fresh and crisp, almost pine freshness, if that makes sense. The sweetness is starting to go away, and these more bitter flavors that initially just kind of gave structure to the tea are now starting to kind of dominate the, the taste profile. If you're interested in exploring the world of post-fermented teas as a whole, I would say that raw puer is probably a good entry point because it's very similar to a green tea. And actually some would argue that it is technically considered a green tea. Um, but that's something that you could try out and compare it to a ripe puer tea, which is going to be completely different. So definitely something to keep in mind as you're on your tea journey. Um, don't write off one category of tea just by one bad tasting experience. There's really a whole complex world out there. So keep trying as many teas as you can, see which ones you like, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you all so much for watching this video. Keep tuning in and I'll be sharing more information about my tea journey as I explore teas that I'm not completely familiar with and I'm tasting them through step by step. If you have any questions about green tea or tea in general, please feel free to leave them in the comments below and we'll see you guys next time.